2015. Thank you. Out into this world, this world, tiny little thing before its time, and a god for what? Girl. Yes, tiny little girl. Into this, out into this, before her time, god forsaken, whole, cold, cold, no matter, parents unknown, unheard of, heaving, vanished, thin air, no sooner buttoned up his britches. She, similarly, eight months later, almost at the tick. So no love spared that. No love such as normally vented on the speechless infant in the home. No. Nor indeed, for that matter, any of any kind. No love of any kind at any subsequent stage. It's a typical affair. Nothing of any note till coming up to 60 when, what? 70, good God. Coming up to 70, wandering in a field, looking aimlessly for cowslips to make a ball. A few steps then, stop, stare into space, then on a few more, stop and stare again, so on. Drifting around when suddenly, gradually, all went out. All that early April morning light and she found herself in the what? Who? No, she! Thank you. For the uninitiated, that is not a celebration of Irish dentistry. Uh, definitely not. Um, I, uh, that's Samuel Beckett's Not I, famous one-woman monologue, um, which is meant to be spoken at the speed of thought. In the auditorium, in the Royal Quarter, wherever else I, I perform it, all the audience see is a disembodied mouth hovering roughly about eight foot above the stage. But because of the sensory deprivation, there's all the lights from exit signs to the toilets outside the auditorium have all been switched off, illegally actually. Um, but the result of that is that the audience experience a kind of group hallucination. They start to see the, the mouth roam and travel across the stage and it's individual for every single member of the audience. Um, it was first written in 1971, so it's what is considered late Beckett. So maybe the verbosity of his earlier novels, like uh, Dante and the Lobster, um, you know, were heavily influenced by Joyce, who he worked with, was pared away, and he became what we call Beckettian. You know, this stripped back, pared, reduced poetry. Um, it was performed in the Lincoln Center in New York in late 1971 by Jessica Tandy, directed by Alan Schneider. And Beckett gave two directives, speak at the speed of thought, or it has to be spoken at the speed of thought, and don't act. Um, Jessica, I, I didn't see the performance, I, I didn't hear much apart from this one anecdote, but she, she rolled in at about 21 minutes. And Beckett went backstage and he said, you destroyed my play. And later he wrote to Alan Schneider, the director, and he said, you know, I'm gonna direct Billy Whitelow in this myself and find out if it's theater or not. When Billy Whitelow, who was his, um, one of his favorite actresses, she'd performed play with him um, a few years before that in 1970 in the Royal Court, and um, when she read the play, she said, you've finally done it, Sam. You've written the unlearnable and the unplayable. <laughs> and she set about trying to learn this extremely difficult text. So I don't know if you're able to pull the, the, what the text looks like, Daisy, up on screen. But you've got these phrases which have three dots. And Beckett's ultimate note to Billy was, Billy, Billy, bring your pencil over here. Can you make those three dots, two dots? And he removed a dot. So uh, he's incredibly pedantic, and the um, text has to be spoken at speed, and very precisely, he wants every word heard. Um, Billy did have four nervous breakdowns trying to learn the piece. And um, during one of her breakdowns, Billy uh, Beckett rushed over to her and said, Billy, Billy, what have I done to you? What have I done? She said, I don't know, Sam. And he said, well, never mind. Back you go. <laughs> um, one of the main reasons for this, and maybe you might, Daisy, be able to show the backstage of what I, not I, looks like backstage. That's me. <laughs> um, so Beckett wasn't a fetishist. <laughs> but... Uh, I keep having to convince myself that. Um, but in order for this mouth to stay on light in this very precise light, and you're speaking at such speed, your whole body vibrates or gyrates, it's necessary at the moment until maybe technology 
can make it a little bit easier on us who perform it um, for our, our head to be strapped in. Billy did it in a kind of dentist chair, chair sat down, but I felt I needed all the energy coming up from my feet, so I opted for standing. Um, I have black makeup from uh, about here until uh, my, my neck, and um, really thick black matte makeup. And then I have a blindfold over my eyes and a pair of tights, Wolford, <laughs> um, <laughs> over my face. And then my stage manager straps my head into this harness where I can't move. And at this point, I can't hear because my hearing is cut off. So uh, I can't see or hear or move. And then I go like the clappers. <laughs> as fast as I can. Um, I grew up in Dublin, um, or, well, Athlone near Dublin, and I began my professional life acting around 18, just when the Gate Theatre were canonizing the works in collaboration with Channel 4 Film and, um, and putting all of his plays on film. And that was the landscape that I became a professional actress. I kind of grew up in Beckett. And I was very lucky about that because I wasn't intimidated by it. I had a kind of, I was impressed by the actors who took a very kind of languid and, and real approach to it. And I was doing another TV series with a, a brilliant Beckett actor, Stephen Brennan, who one day on set told me all about this one woman play, Not I and how the mouth starts to osculate. And he painted this picture that I just couldn't forget. I was transfixed by it. And um, he also told me, which I spammed from my mind, that he knew an actress who tried to learn it, and she'd gone mad. And, um, and she had to give up the part. They couldn't do it. She couldn't learn it in time, so they had to pull the performance. Years later, in 2005, I was sent the script. And I didn't immediately make this connection with this image that I'd seen, but what I saw was a transcript of how my mind works. I saw thought drawn out in such incredible poetry that it wasn't this kind of linear stream of consciousness, but thoughts interrupting other thoughts and layers and panic and fear and hilarity. And I knew instinctively it had to be spoken at speed. So I auditioned and I got the part. And I had another job at the time, which I still do. Um, <laughs> I, I worked in PR and I couldn't afford to leave my job for this measly paid theater uh, role. So I said, well, we're only doing half days. I can just probably take you know, a bit of time. And uh, she said, if you don't hand in your notice, I'm going, to, um, I'm going to have to recast. Billy Whitelow had several nervous breakdowns and you're just not going to be able to double job. So I had a week between the start of rehearsal and I went away to a house and I put my face against the wall and I did good old fashioned Irish punishment and I bet it into me. And on the first day of rehearsal, she said, have you, have you handed in your notice? And I said, no, but listen. And I did the entire piece, I don't know how, looking back, but I did the entire piece flawlessly, and she had to cast me. So our biggest task was to banish any mention of Billy Whitelaw. Um, I had to find my own access point to this. If I had seen her performance, or you know, if I had read about her experience, I think I would have tried to emulate it in some way, therefore breaking Beckett's rule, don't act. Um, it was impossible to do because her name is synonymous with the role and every you know, do-gooder wants to tell you all about Billy Whitelaw. But we tried and we managed to succeed and I, 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 I performed the piece and I did it around maybe 12 minutes back then and Edward Beckett came to the, um, to the performance and uh, he is the keeper of the estate. You know, he's famous for taking down productions that don't meet the Beckettian requirements. And he put me in touch with Billy. And because I'd performed the piece, I was able to absorb her. I was able to meet her. I'd found my own entry point. And we greeted each other like two lost war veterans. She'd never met anyone who'd played the role, neither had I. 
And it was just this immediate and instant bond. And about a year later, she called me up out of the blue and she said, can you come round please? I want to give you his notes. I need to give you his notes. So I came round, but I didn't know why. I was humoring this lovely elder lady, but I didn't know if I was gonna ever perform the piece again. And obviously I was interested. I thought she'd pull out some manuscript, some rehearsal notebook, and show me some of Beckett's notes. But she said, no, can you sit down, please? Begin. I began the piece, and she started conducting me, just as Beckett had conducted her across her kitchen table. And then this weird coincidence happened. Jude Kelly called me up out of the blue and asked me to perform Not I in the South Bank Centre. So Billy and I stepped up our sessions. And sadly, a few days before I was due to perform, Billy went into hospital, and she hasn't been out since. But that piece had the greatest impact on her. She chose it to be the lining of her autobiography. And even though she's performed all of Beckett's work, some of the work he's written for her, that piece in particular had the greatest impact, probably because she feels she lost a large part of herself when she was doing it. Um, why do I do it? <laughs> How do I do it? You know, it's, it's still as hard today as it was back then. One of the main challenges, aside from learning it, which is incredibly difficult, is your own internal not I, um, which is genius the way Beckett captures it, because what happens simultaneously is exactly what's going on in the monologue. It's the stream of consciousness of a woman's life flashing before her, the stubborn vestiges, I guess. And what's really interesting is I spoke to Billy recently, very recently, and she can still, to this day, say large part of the beginning of it flawlessly. I use three forms of memory. One is the oral, Beckett writes like music, and those three dots, and the two dots are akin to a crotchet versus a quaver, and I'm really driven by the, the rhythm of it. The, the other is the narrative, which you know isn't that obscure, it's just fragmented. And the other is the text, and that's my text. And I know every stain, every te tear, every, yeah. And I, I, I know where I am on the page. It's how I orientate myself, because it's so disorientating. While the audience see this mouth travel across the stage, when I'm performing it, even though I'm strapped in position, I feel like I'm taking flight around the auditorium. And the only thing I can cling on to is the memory of those words on the page. I performed it last May at the Royal Court and um, it sold out in four and a half hours. People turned up for an eight and a half minute play, which is how I'm, I'm performing it now. And when you mark the difference of what Billy gave to me when we sat across the table, there was two main points that she helped me with. The, the don't act. And I was so worried about the intelligibility for the audience because I was going too fast. I felt I was going too fast. And she said that Beckett had always said to her, you can't go fast enough. I need this to play on the nerves of the audience, not the intellect. And the speed is going to make it bypass the intellect the don't act. I mean, it's so hard not to pause at this incredible poetry um, or curate the work to resist that temptation. That's not to say he doesn't want expression. He does. He wants all of it. He wants the real stuff. And uh, the way it's written, when you kind of get out of the way of it, the words produce those emotions, that panic, that fear. Um, when I performed it at the Royal Court, Walter Asmus, who was Beckett's um, favorite director and longtime collaborator, attended the performance. And uh, he, he came to three performances and came backstage on the third, and he said, I'll direct you and Beckett's other two, uh, Footfalls and Rockabye. Uh, they've never been performed by one actress together, and uh, he suggested doing them all in one night, one after another. Um, Footfalls is normally played by two actresses of a mother off stage. And he said, I think you can do both. 
So um, I've just finished last week a, a West End transfer of this piece that opened in the Royal Court, um, playing all three roles. It's a bleak world, the Beckett world, um, and it's lonely and it's uncompromising, but it's also the greatest privilege. I don't know of another writer who's going to ask so much of me. Um, I don't even feel like a woman when I'm performing it. Let's not, you know, grumble um, of how few roles there are for women. But for anybody, that the landscape is so vast, I feel like a continent. So it's been an utter privilege in my life that his words have crossed my path. But um, come March 2015, I think I'm definitely going to hang up the lips. <laughs> I'll leave it there. Thank you. <laughs>